The horrors of World War II, he hoped, reshaped the world in a, in a way that would lessen such devastating conflict and destruction. Until this time, collective efforts had not been able to hold back war. Um, but Nuremberg changed this, he hoped. Its long-range significance, he argued, lay in the effort to demonstrate or to establish the supremacy of law over such lawless and catastrophic forces as war and persecutions. From Nuremberg might come legal controls of these disastrous forces, but only the coming years would show whether the efforts at Nuremberg were, he said, but a flash of light in an otherwise dark century or the harbinger of a drawing. Even as he urged that human action through law could hold back the forces of warfare, Jackson warned of a different future. If the East and West cannot or will not bridge the gaps of interest and method and political viewpoint now evident and so often over-dramatized, it may be that the good efforts of this drawing together in jurisprudential principles and procedures, sorry, that's a long slide, um, will be dissipated. Um, he simply, however, he found it difficult to believe that we will not be able to live together without sacrificing either peace or fundamental interest. My task today is to set, I'm so sorry, um, all the ideas away so you just forget what you just saw. <laughs> My task is to set Justice Jackson in the world he occupied when he returned from Nuremberg and to try to follow him as that world fell apart. I mean, not personally, but, but the way the, the, the world uh, as it exists in terms of the state of peace and war sort of fell apart. If war or security affected American law, then we need to think about what was that war or security? And how did it come into domestic lawmaking? When legal scholars write about the impact of war on law, they often look very closely at the law part of it, but take war as a given. Um, they cite each other about what the contours of the war was and, and how long it lasted, as opposed to, for example, um, looking to diplomatic history and military history and really sort of interrogating the nature of war. Um, so, as with any law and society problem, if we want to understand the impact of, of, of social issues on law, we need to look at both sides of the equation. So we need to look seriously at the nature of war and security um, when we think about how it might have filtered in and affected American law. So there are a set of ideas about war and peace were held by the World War II generation. Wartime and peacetime were more or less distinct states. People could tell when they were in a wartime. After all, Congress would declare it. Imagine that. Um, wartime was followed by peacetime, and this meant that wars were, by definition, temporary. Rights were sometimes compromised in wartime. You've heard the little swinging pendulum story. And presidents sometimes overstepped the limits of their power. But since war times were temporary, this would all eventually go away. Um, the basic structure to thinking about war times still works in American jurisprudence. Um, even in the age of drone warfare, when apparently it's not a war if only the other people get hurt. Um, but, but there was a moment when this way of thinking seemed to collapse. Uh, when the concept of peacetime dissolved, leading instead, as Justice Jackson put it, a prolonged period of international tension and rumors of war, when war itself, uh, uh, with war itself as ever-threatening, an ever-threatening alternative. This is how Jackson viewed the world when he returned to Buffalo to deliver the inaugural Mitchell Lecture in 1951. Let's think about the way history unfolded and whether Jackson's vision of peace through law and legal institutions could survive in an era that came to be called the Cold War. Before the Nuremberg Tribunal heard its first witness, 
writers on both sides of the Atlantic um, took and, and around the world took stock of a world reshaped by the advent of nuclear weapons. In the fall of 1945, George Orwell wrote that the bomb was likely to change the structure of global politics. Weak states would become weaker, and two or three monstrous super states, each with nuclear weapons, would divide the world between them. These monster states would not use the bomb against each other. Instead, each state might be an uncon in an unconquerable, permanent state of Cold War with its neighbors. The nuclear age would be, therefore, a Cold War era in which the world would see an end to large-scale wars at the cost of prolonging indefinitely a peace that is no peace. The idea of a Cold War was, of course, intentionally contra contradictory, suggesting an era of war but not war. It was a time of deep anxiety in American culture, and nothing captured this more clearly than the doomsday clock. First called the clock of doom when it appeared in June 1947, the clock measured movement toward a nuclear apocalypse. It was intended to represent the state of mind of nuclear scientists, but soon became a ubiquitous symbol of nuclear danger. In 1953, after both the United States and Soviet Union tested powerful thermonuclear bombs, the hands of the clock moved to two minutes to midnight, so that in the words of bulletin editor Eugene Rabinowitz, only a few more swings of the pendulum and atomic explosions will strike midnight for Western civilization. Underlying the anxiety of the Cold, of Cold War thought was the idea that once nuclear weapons had come into existence, nuclear war was inevitable. In March 1946, while the Nuremberg trial was in session, Winston Churchill warned that an iron curtain had descended across the continent of Europe. This was a solemn moment as the United States, at the pinnacle of world power, shouldered awe-inspiring accountability to the future. For Churchill, Soviet power and aggression could not be reined in by international law. They could only be met by, with American strength and solidarity with Western Europe. The anxieties of the nuclear age were manifested in post-World War II national security politics. Historian Michael Hogan argues that Cold War struggles over American policy and the nature of the state were about more than combating communism. Also at stake was American national security, um, national identity, the nation's role in the world, and the impact of the Cold War on domestic institutions. After World War II, Americans hoped for a turn, return to peacetime concerns. Initially, American leaders divided in their perceptions of the world conditions they confronted. In battles over the budget and military policy, some policymakers viewed the idea of distinctions between war and peace to be a technicality outmoded in the new era, when the United States needed to be prepared for war on a permanent basis. The central challenge of state-making in the early Cold War, Hogan argues, was to prepare for a permanent struggle without surrendering constitutional principles and democratic traditions to the garrison state. President Truman initially tried to maintain the idea of a peacetime world and insisting that his policies were not mobilization for war, but war preparedness. But Truman himself encouraged war hysteria to generate support for foreign aid to Greece and Turkey in his Truman Doctrine speech in March 1947. Framing the Cold War as an epic struggle, Truman warned that at the present moment in world history, nearly every nation must choose between alternative ways of life the choice was too often not a free one. Truman con uh, contrasted between a way of life based upon the will of the majority, distinguished by free institutions, etc., and a second way of life relying on terror, oppression, a controlled press, uh, radio, and fixed elections, and suppression of personal freedom. To safeguard American liberty, Truman insisted that the United States must provide the free people who were resisting communism around the world um, with support. So the Truman Doctrine was about the projection of American power 
not about maintaining peace through international institutions. The following year would seem darker with the coup in Czechoslovakia, the Berlin um, uh, uh, blockade of West, the blockade of West Berlin by the, by the Soviets with the goal of American, French, and uh, British troops being driven from the city and this is a picture of the Berlin airlift. In response to increasing global tensions in a, bi uh, in a bipolar world, the idea was to project American power. Um, if international law might restrain aggression, it was at least a distant second to power economic and military. In August 1949, the Soviet Union exploded its first bomb. Uh, this was also the time of the fall of China to the communists. Um, and then in June 1950, North Korea invades um, South Korea. Events seemed to propel the world closer to the fringe brink, and American leaders crafted a Cold War strategy premised on, on the idea that projecting American military power around the world uh, was the best means of safeguarding American security. NSC 68, uh, this important report, would remain secret during Jackson's lifetime, but became central to American national security policy. At home, Cold War anxieties filtered into domestic politics, so in February 1950, Senator Joe McCarthy, he was looking for a campaign issue. Uh, someone else had taken up crime to control, so he turned to anti-communism, and that February falsely claimed that he had in his hand a list of 205 communists employed in the State Department. He would not be alone in running for office on red baiting. Um, meanwhile, Hogan writes, national security became a common currency of policymakers, the arbiter of most values, the key to America's identity. In American national security ideology, the distinction between war and peace had disappeared as the government transitioned to a national security state. These global tensions troubled Robert Jackson as he resumed his role as a Supreme Court Justice. Um, and they challenged his vision to peace through law. In the spring of 1947, the specter of imminent war did not worry him, but instead the spread of totalitarianism, which he said left the world more fear-ridden than it was at the close of a war to give freedom from fear. Jackson's most memorable opinion on individual rights and war had been West Virginia Board of Education versus Barnett in 1943. Um, and that was the case where the court struck down a mandatory flag salute requirement um, so that these children had been expelled from school uh, for refusing to exclude this flag for religious reasons. And, and then in, in one of his soaring opinions, Jackson wrote, struggles to coerce uniformity of sentiment in support of some end thought to be essential uh, to their time and country had been waged by many good as well as evil men. But the ultimate futility of efforts to compel coherence um, is the lesson of every such effort from the Roman drive to stand out Christianity as the disturber of pagan unity, um, uh, down, it mentions other examples, down to the fast failing efforts of our present totalitarian enemies. Those who begin force of elimination of dissent soon find themselves in exterminating dissenters. Um, so if the rights of Jehovah's Witnesses appealed to Jackson's constitutional uh, sympathies, Cold War era radicals certainly did not. He sided with the majority in the prosecution of the uh, of Communist Party members in Dennis versus the United States. Um, uh, they were prosecuted not for concrete actions geared toward overthrowing the government, um, but for teaching and advocating radical ideas. Um, now, interestingly, in this and other cases, Jackson didn't apply the court's prevailing First Amendment doctrine to the defendants in the Dennis case. That would be the normal thing to do. You think they're dangerous, you apply a clear and present danger test, uh, and you find that notwithstanding of other First Amendment rights, that, that the government can, ne can nevertheless uh, prosecute them. Um, instead, Jackson devotes much of his concurrence in that case to a description of the methods of communists drawing lessons from recent experience, including the coup in Czechoslovakia, um, where he says, 
uh, that, that basically in other countries, communists had risen to power in part through taking advantage of, for example, um, free speech rights. Um, the clear and present danger test in the First Amendment, Jackson said, had been developed for a different era. When the issue of criminality of a hot-headed speech on a street corner or circulation of a few incendiary pamphlets or refusal of a handful of children to salute the flag, when that's what's going on, it is not beyond the capacity of the judicial process to gather, comprehend, and weigh the necessary materials for decision, whether, whether it is a clear and present danger of substantive evil or a harmless letting off of steam. But this doctrine should not apply to communists, he argued, a well-organized nationwide conspiracy, unless we are to hold our government captive in a judge-made trap. In rejecting the claims of the Dennis defendants, he placed most of his attention on facts not in evidence, but on what he knew or what he believed about communism in the world. Um, in the flag salute case, protecting rights safeguarded democracy, in Dennis, rights seemed to threaten democracy. In arguing that the security threat counseled departure from the court's otherwise applicable doctrine, Jackson argument, Jackson's argument was triggered by his assessment of the threat by a national security judgment, the sort of calculus courts are usually reluctant to engage in. Jackson's attention to the nature of communism was also important as his concurrence and dissent in American Communications Association versus Dowd, a case that upheld uh, a requirement that uh, that union officers had to sign an anti-communist uh, affidavit before their union could take advantage of labor law protections. Um, the, uh, he, he said the Congress could regularly have concluded that the Communist Party is something different in fact from any other substantial party we have known and hence may constitutionally be treated as something different in law. Again, existing principles simply had to be cast aside for this dangerous group. Jackson's analysis in this opinion was so resonant that it was reprinted in the New York Times magazine. These opinion, in these opinions, we don't see the idea of a swinging pendulum, swinging from rights uh, uh, toward security during wartime. Instead, we see one group, communists, outside the community entitled to laws protection. Jackson's views about communism would carry through even to cases that had significant human rights implications, um, particularly Harriet Yannis versus Shaughnessy in 1952, when Jackson wrote the majority opinion upholding the deportation of three resident aliens who arrived in the United States as children and then later joined the Communist Party. So they were being deported for their later uh, party membership. His analysis was not driven by the idea that the Cold War was a wartime. The power to deport was greater in war, he, he, he noted. Uh, but Congress, Congress you know, apprehension of foreign or internal danger short of war may lead to its use. Uh, but war-ish meta metaphors informed his opinion. Um, the due process clause is, is resonant with one of them. It's Holmes' opinion where it basically said, in Buck versus Bell, where it basically what acknowledges that the best citizens give up their lives for the country, so we shouldn't be troubled by, you know, folks like uh, the, this uh, woman considered to be mentally retarded who was then compulsorily sterilized. sterilized. But these lesser uh, burdens placed on, on, on others when the best citizens give their lives for the country. Jackson said the due process clause did not shield the citizen from conscription and the consequent calamity of being separated from family, friends, home, and business while he is transported to foreign lands to stem the, stop, the tide of communism. If communist aggression creates such hardships for loyal citizens, it is hard to find justification for, for holding that the Constitution requires that its hardships much, must be spared the, the communist alien. So somehow this quasi-war had made communists a quasi-enemy. Um, Jackson's human rights vision um, 
had been crafted in an era when many European Jews became stateless in their flight from the Holocaust. So Jackson was attuned to the great human impact of the deportation power. Still, uh, he wrote, we think that in the present state of the world, it would be rash and irresponsible to reinterpret our fundamental law to deny or qualify the government's power of deportation. For Jackson, rights in these cases turned not on whether the nation was in wartime or peacetime, but on the nature of the threat. He argued that the political branches were better at judging the proper response to national security problems, but nevertheless, he rested his opinions on his own national security analysis. Um, what of the war powers and Jackson? This is a bit of an end on an upbeat note, I promise. Um, what of the war powers um, and Jackson's tremendously influential analysis in the steel seizure case? Um, that, that 1952 case in which the court struck down Truman's effort uh, to seize a steel mill to avert a strike is remembered by constitutional scholars as a, um, as a War, as a case about presidential power during wartime. One of the few cases when the court said to the president, you can't use this war power in this way during wartime. Uh, and so we might be able to brush the ambiguities of the Cold War era aside, since the case deals squarely with Truman's ability to seize steel mills during the Korean War when steel was necessary for production of war material. Jackson's concurrence famously categorizes the scope of presidential power based on whether or not the president is acting pursuant to or against authorization from Congress. And what I want to do right now is talk about the parts of the opinion that don't end up in your casebook, that actually now are more resonant than ever. Jackson remarks, he is, so, so it's not wartime that's driving his analysis. Uh, it con you know, concurring in the majority opinion denying Truman his power. Jackson remarks on the slipperiness of the categories. Loose and irresponsible use of adjectives colors all non-legal and much legal discussion of presidential powers. Inherent power, implied power, incidental power, plenary power, war power, emergency power are used often interchangeably without fixed uh, or ascertainable meanings. And he warns that a president cannot have the power to define, he, he warns that the president cannot have the power to define an era as a war, thereby triggering his own war powers. Uh, Jackson didn't find it necessary or appropriate to decide was the Korean War uh, a war. He called it the Korean enterprise. Um, he wouldn't give to Truman, you know, the, he wouldn't say, let's call it a war. Some, at one point he says, he, 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 um, he says, well, it's not a de jure war, I suppose, maybe it's a de facto war. Um, but Congress, he said, retained the power to declare war, and they had not used it here. In Korea, the president had acted without Congress, thereby seeming to invest himself with the war powers. No doctrine the court could promulgate would seem to me more sinister and alarming, Jackson wrote, than if a president whose conduct of foreign affairs is so largely uncontrolled and often even unknown can vastly enlarge his mastery over the internal affairs of, his, of the country by his own commitment of the nation's armed forces to some foreign venture. Um, Jackson himself had argued that President Roosevelt could draw upon the commander-in-chief powers long before Congress declared war in World War II. Um, here, he says, the court should be distinguishing his efforts uh, from the steel seizure. The court should not limit the president's work, the, the kind of powers FDR had used before World War II. Um, and the war powers deserve the widest latitude he said, at least when turned against the outside world for the security of our society, it was the internal use of these powers uh, that troubled Jackson. We do not have a militaristic system, um, he argued, but a constitutional republic. The purpose of, of placing the presidency and the commander-in-chief in one person was to ensure that the civilian would control the military, not to enable the military to subordinate the presidential office. 
No pens would ever expiate the sin against free government of holding that a president can escape control of executive powers by law through assuming his military role. The reliance on emergency power by European governments during World War II, he said, showed emergency powers are consistent with free government only when control is lodged elsewhere in the executive who exercises them. Um, so if, if Jackson's anti-communist opinions seem to tie to the fears of his era, um, it is the steel seizure concurrence that helps us to look forward. His most important critique, as, as, as influential as his tripartite anal analysis of presidential power is, I think looking back for us now, his most important critique was that the president had himself declared an era of wartime and then argued that the self-declared wartime was the occasion for the expansion of his own powers. Korea, he said, was a foreign venture. Um, and, uh, and when it came to the powers of war in our system of government, those powers have to be reined in by law. Um, So we can see from the, st the steel seizure case uh, that this problem existed long before a president would declare war on, on terrorism. And don't worry, in the book, we'll go after President Obama too, remember the drone. Um, but we can, uh, presidents themselves announce a wartime, commit American troops, and thereby create the occasion for the invocation of their own powers. Um, when Robert Jackson returned to Buffalo to deliver the first Mitchell Lecture um, on May 9, 951, he spoke of an altered world that he had imagined in 1946 when he gave that other lecture. This time his topic was wartime security and liberty under law, but his title belied the ambiguity of the era. His lecture drew from his opinions of the previous few years when he often described the era in such fluid terms. Jackson had once thought of 1946 as an ending to warfare, but this new era had not brought a peacetime. Instead, he told the audience at Buffalo, the best that we can see now, the best that we can now hope for seems to be a prolonged period of international tension and rumors of war, with war itself as the ever-threatening alternative. In this environment, we can never take liberty or security for granted. Um, and let me just skip ahead because I do have to run to the airport. Um, but I think that we, um, uh, you know, he, uh, the, the, the way he described his world um, in those post number of years, he says in 954, uh, the last year of his life, America was troubled, disillusioned, and confused. Um, and I think sometimes of the way he thought about his world as being so much more similar to the world that we have been occupying, where we don't see these finite lines between war and peace. We see this sort of hovering threat of security. Um, it's hard to define it and pin it down. But what we also see is presidents defining the age, presidents going in alone, sometimes getting Congress along with them, um, what we don't see is the American people playing a role um, in a politics of war. We don't, I think, have a check on executive power um, to basically call in war, uh, call in the troops, and then uh, draw upon the then self-generated war power, um, unless we have the American people essentially checking back in, uh, having, being told not to go shopping, um, being, uh, being encouraged to participate um, in the military action done in their name and that we therefore ultimately bear responsibility for. Um, in, in, in Jackson's steel seizure opinion, um, he, you know, he's in this era when his vision of holding back power through law, holding back warfare through law, seems not to hold. And what he's left with, I think, is simply a faith. You know, a faith that somehow, in some way, legal institutions can do something. Um, that the people, through legal institutions, can do something. Um, the national security state is developing underneath them. 
right? But he believes that political action, collective action through law, that it's not all determined from there, right? That, that, that a politics and, and, a, and a use of law can hold back the forces of warfare. Um, he says at the end of his um, steel seizure opinion, with all its defects, delays, and inconveniences, um, humans have discovered no technique for long preserving free government, except that the executive be under the law, and that the law be made by parliamentary deliberations. And we might build into that uh, uh, informed by a politics where the people are actually involved. Such institutions may be destined to pass away, he said, but it is the duty of the court, and I would say it was the duty of all of us here to be the last, not to first, the first to give it up. So thank you so much. And I'm so sorry I can't do Thank you. 
Certainly the United States participated in the Security Council debate. And since there was, it did not exercise its veto, it could be said that the United States did willingly embark on state of war. Is this something that Justice Jackson took account of in his uh, writing on the case itself? I would say only in the passing phrases that Mary quoted. Of course, the part of the United States at the Security Council is the executive branch. Uh, and so, yes, non-veto, yes, acquiescence in the United Nations action by the president, in a sense, awarding himself war powers, uh, which is what leads Jackson to use those phrases like enterprise and venture, as opposed to Article One's war power, the declaration power belonging to the Congress. First of all, I have a couple of questions on the comparison of the uh, evacuation of the Jews from Nuremberg and the internment of the uh, Japanese uh, in the American uh, West. Number one, how many Jewish casualties were there during the evacuation of Nuremberg as compared to the evacuation of Japanese in California? And number two, with respect to the real property, personal property of the Evacuees, what was the game plan in Nuremberg compared to the game plan in uh, the American West? Um, if, if, if the question, the question about the deportations from from uh, from Nuremberg and, and Würzburg in late '41 and then early 1942, and how many um, casualties there would have been during the deportation itself, as opposed to what might have occurred once people disembarked in the East, um, the answer is that the cases would be comparable because this was before the, um, this was before the so-called final, so the, the genocidal final solution to the Jewish question, as it was phrased at the time. And these deportations, um, actually, people did bring luggage with them, uh, and they, uh, in fact, were um, deported on passenger trains. This was before the, the, the horrors of the cattle cars, and, and which, which would come later. Uh, so, so that's, that's, that's a factual answer to the question that you posed. Um, the, the, the second question you asked was about disposition of property. Um, and there's little question that the entire program in Nazi Germany was vastly more rapacious than the system in the United States was. In other words, the, the Jews weren't going to get their property back. But the Japanese, presumably, were intended to return to their homes and their, and their property. The, 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 gov the US government put um, modest structures in place to, uh, to assist Japanese Americans in trying to secure their property on the West Coast with the thought that they would ultimately uh, return. Um, uh, as it happened, those systems in fact broke down and most Japanese American families lost most everything. But that was uh, in, in significant measure through private action rather than government dispossession. You mean if the property was looted or they yes. lost titles to the property? Both. Um, D. Matura uh, made mention of the International Criminal Court in the introduction, uh, linking it uh, to Nuremberg, and, and perhaps filling out Jackson's question, which he says, well, we don't know what the meaning of Nuremberg is when Jackson speaks, uh, maybe later. And I thought we all have results if we actually have an idea what Nuremberg means now. Because um, looking at the International Criminal Court, it seems to have a lot of the ambiguity that Jackson raised about Nuremberg. Uh, sorry, the International Criminal Court now, uh, issues of power, victims justice, they seem to have excellent specialization in Africa, which might be perfectly appropriate, but, uh, you know, so do we actually know what Nuremberg means now? Um, we're we even more confused than Jackson might have been then. Go for it, John. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a very good question. I guess it's always uh, an unfolding answer. So, a snapshot moment right now. The ICC is an infant institution with all the uh, startup issues and complexities and personnel quality and problems that, that you allude to. Uh, there, there's no question that it is uh, a logical and structural successor to the International Military Tribunal. That it, Nuremberg to ICTY, ICTR, ICC chain with a large Cold War gap is direct structural. Um, and I think that uh, it is striking how much Nuremberg matters 
to the participants in today's 21st century international tribunals. Uh, not just prosecutors, but judges, defense attorneys, and so forth. There's, there's something of a gold standard uh, looking back uh, reflex that they all do have. So in their startup environment, uh, that's one measure of the connection. Uh, you know, beyond that, I guess I would stay tuned. <laughs> see, you in, see you in 60 years. Right. We'll all be back here together 60 years from now. Thanks. Professor Miller, uh, in law school I was forced to talk uh, from Lon Fuller. And he uh, suggested that in the rule of law, if one drew a line graph as a spectrum of intimacy and put families at one end of the graph and countries at the other, that law, law worked particularly well in the middle, not so well uh, at either end. But suggested that in the, in the middle, as to your point, that ambition and arrogance of power uh, required sort of an unfettered and more engaged populace to respond to those abuses, whether it be Joseph McCarthy or whether it be uh, in the situation you postulate. Um, and I wonder if you have any thoughts about that in terms of uh, incumbency and in political life in terms of that uh, well, degree of power. It's a fascinating, I had not heard that before, and it's not, but I, I, I will certainly use that. Uh, <laughs> thank you for sharing it. Um, uh, the first thing I thought about really in response to your question is um, uh, the idea that um, in um, this question of the middle, um, um, this is something that um, initially by, I guess in a sense, being forced, uh, and then by um, choice of later generations, um, the, his the, the historiography about the Holocaust has grappled with significantly. Um, there is an enormous literature that looks at this question of the middle. Um, um, not so much the folks who were on trial, right, in front of the floor with Robert Jackson as the prosecutor, but the, the people in the middle, the great mass of people who ran the Nazi state as opposed to the people directing it from the top. Uh, and, and in that literature, there was an enormous debate in the 70s through the 1980s um, about this question of whether the real engine of the final solution uh, came from a kind of you know, homicidal racism imposed from above, or whether instead it was much more a manifestation of much more mundane, ordinary kinds of um, bureaucratic striving and competition and one agency trying to outdo the other and one Benno Martin trying to get a promotion before the, the, the police chief in the neighboring district did. Um, so I, I suspect that that's, that literature is something that Fuller might have been quite intrigued by. Um, the thing that in my own scholarship I am working on as I work more and more years at this stuff about uh, the incarceration of Japanese Americans is the complete absence in the American historiography of any attention to a comparable question. All of the attention in the historiography of that episode has focused on a very, very small handful of individuals at the very top. People just one level above Carl Bendison. But there has been no acknowledgment in the American literature that this was like slavery, like Jim Crow, like the dispossession and, and, and frankly, murder of Native Americans, many other examples that we could cite. These were systems that ran with people, many of them lawyers. Uh, and so um, I, I guess the only thing I would say in response to your question to wrap up is that I would hope, um, and it's part of the aspiration of this paper to try to bring some attention to the middle, um, uh, which is where I guess many, many years ago, uh, Professor Fuller suggested we place it. Great. Again, I would like to thank our distinguished lecturers and invite us to continue this discussion at a reception upstairs in the Salino and Barnes Conference Center, which is on the fifth.